Another wonderful anthem, I'm sure you agree, and when you look in the bulletin and you see that right beside the uh, title of the anthem, that A-R-R dot German, that's, uh, that's a polite way of, of David of, of telling you that he arranged that anthem. Again, we have a lot of those. I'm not sure we as a congregation appreciate. Uh, uh, I don't know why the Lord gave him so many gifts and left me out, but... It is what it is. Well, turn to the book of Daniel, if you would. We're going to take a short break from our Summer in the Psalms series and look at Daniel 5, verses 1 through 9, and verse 25 through 31. Obviously, things are a little more patriotic today, and I always struggle uh, with knowing how to merge patriotism into our time of worship because we are Christians first and foremost. And our citizenship is in heaven, and we are looking for a better country, as the book of Hebrews says, another country. It's a better country, uh, one that, whose builder and maker is God. But that said, we are also Americans, and we're free, aren't we? And we're glad to be Americans. We're, I hope we are. We're proud to be Americans. I know people complain about our country, and and uh, there, there are things that are wrong, but there are a lot of things that are right. And if people complain too much, as far as I'm concerned, they go live somewhere else. Uh, we're not stopping them. So um, I have no, I've been to a lot of places in the world. There's no place I'd rather live, even with all the problems that we have in our country. One of which has been that we haven't been quite as free lately, have we? We have been free to, to gather for worship. We're not free right now to sit next to each other unless you're a couple or a family. Um, we haven't been free to have communion until uh, recently here. And so I've wondered, is the Lord giving us a little warning, a little foretaste of what it's like to not be free? And we grumble about it, don't we? We get upset. I have. I think you have too. I've heard from some of you. And you just don't like it. We want to be free, but uh, unless things change in our country, and hopefully they will by the grace of God, uh, but if they don't change, the day may come when we will look back on this day and say, remember the good old days when the only freedom we lost was the freedom to sit next to each other. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word, and uh, thank you for what we've already heard this morning, how you've spoken to our hearts and souls, and uh, we, we rejoice that it is well with our souls, because you're a great God, and a great king above all other kings, and you're the one that raises nations, and you bring them down. They're just a drop in the bucket to you. So look upon us with favor. We remember you would not destroy Sodom if ten righteous people were found there. Surely we have more than that, but help us do our part. Sanctify us, uh, as Dale said earlier, and help us to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Savior that we'll be faithful citizens of this country and faithful citizens of the, of the better country uh, above. And to that end, use, use your word this morning. Uh, that we may uh, hear you speak to us today. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Daniel 5, uh, the first nine verses, King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and of silver that Nebuchadnezzar his father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Immediately, the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace opposite the lampstand. And the king saw the hand as it wrote. Then the king's color changed, and his thoughts alarmed him. His limbs gave way, and his knees knocked together. 
The king called loudly to bring in the enchanters, the Chaldeans, the astrologers. The king declared to the wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and shows me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or make known to the king the interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly alarmed and his color changed and his lords were perplexed. You perhaps know the story and know that there was only one who could interpret the handwriting on the wall, and that was Daniel. And he did so. And uh, he delivered bad news to Belshazzar that he'd been weighed in the balances and found warning. Let's skip down to verse 25. Daniel speaking. This is the writing that was inscribed, Bini, Mini, Tekel, and Parson. This is the interpretation of the matter. Many. God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. Perez, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Amen. Thank you, Dale. Thank you, Tom, uh, for your uh, leadership this morning. I've never served in the military. In some ways, I wish I had. In some ways, I wish everybody would serve, at least in a small way. I think it'd be good for us. I think it'd be good for our country. A little sweat equity uh, goes a long way toward making us uh, appreciate the things that we have and things that uh, others have done for us and giving more than just sweat uh, to furnish us with the freedoms that we have today. Kristen and I have just finished watching the Band of Brothers uh, series. I'm sure some of you have seen it. And when I look at these uh, soldiers, uh, young men, boys in some cases, they seem like boys to me. I suppose I'm getting older. <laughs> but um, I see the things that they endured, the sacrifices they made. Uh, Utah Beach, Omaha Beach, uh, the cold and snow of Bastogne, I'm somewhat ashamed I'm not more patriotic than I am. Uh, out of sight, out of mind, right? It's easy for us to forget. Greater love is no man than this, that a man should lay down his life for his friends. I think the love of country is a good thing, and um, that's while I readily acknowledge that there are many, many things wrong that I'd like to see God fix, if he, if he would, in his mercy. Let's talk about the Babylonians for just a few minutes. These are going to be the fastest three points you've ever heard, and then I'm going to keep going. That's the, that's the bad news for you. But the three points will be pretty quick. First, the Babylonians were living in denial. They were living in denial. Verse 1, King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Everybody thought the Babylonians were invincible, especially the Babylonians. And rightly so, because they had an unlimited water supply. They had stores of food that would last for years. There were three walls around the city that appeared to be impregnable. And so they thought, as we would have too, that they were invincible. And so Belshazzar threw a party, and a fine party it was. The wine was served, and the music played, and the ladies may have danced, and the lords laughed, and a great time was had by all. But the wolf was crouching at the door. 
So they parted on, apparently oblivious to their imminent danger. People live in denial all the time, don't they? We've done it. Others do it. Prisons are full of people who never thought they'd get caught. If they thought they'd get caught, they wouldn't do it, I don't think. But they're full of people who never thought they'd get caught, never thought they'd suffer the consequences, somehow thought they could, as we say, have their cake and eat it too. I heard about a man <clears throat> recently who was out very late and was pulled over by the police at 2 a.m. in the morning. And the officer asked the man, once he rolled down his window, said, what are you doing this time of night? And the man thought for a moment, and he said, well, I'm, I'm on my way to a lecture about alcohol abuse and smoking and the dangers of being out too late. And the policeman said, really now? Who would be giving a lecture at this hour of the night? He said, that would be my wife. <laughs> we always get caught. We reap what we sow. People live in denial of eternal judgment. They say, uh, sin's not so bad. If it's even sin, it's not so bad. And God is love, if he really exists. So no need to worry about eternal judgment. The Babylonians lived in denial first. Secondly, they also lived in defiance. They partied in defiance, maybe a better way to say it. Verse 2, Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar's father had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. These were sacred things. This just wasn't any old cup. These came from the temple, God's house. God's symbolic house, and they were reserved for holy hands and sacred use. And, but Belshazzar on this occasion with the grand party, a thousand of his lords decided to bring out those sacred vessels from God's holy temple, and they drank from them. The lords, the king himself, the wives, even the concubines. And in so doing, they praised the gods of what gold and silver and bronze and iron and stone and wood. And you see what he was saying? He was essentially boasting that the Babylonian gods were superior to Israel's God and to Israel. And if he knew about Darius outdoors at his door, if he knew about him, perhaps he was thinking that these gods would surely save the day. But they didn't. And so point number three, death. Death and the demise of the kingdom. Verse 30, that very night Belshazzar the Chaldean king was killed. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom. Being about 62 years old, Babylon was done. And now the new power was the Medes and the Persians. Darius was clever. He dammed the river around the city, and when the water level dropped, he and his armies went in through the portals. And you know the rest of the story. The fall of Babylon is a great picture of what happens, what God does to any people, any nation that denies his existence and defies his law. And it can happen so quickly like a thief in the night. That very night, Belshazzar was killed. That very night, this great, invincible kingdom was done. Some of you are old enough to remember when uh, Gorbachev became the uh, general secretary of the Soviet Union. It took five years before that mighty empire fell. It's not a long time. We're all concerned about our own country and the division that 
exists here. I hear people say we've never been more divided than since the days of the Civil War. Maybe, maybe not. I remember 1968. Some of you do too. When uh, Senator Kennedy was assassinated, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, when uh, there were riots in Chicago at the Democratic National Convention, and there were estimates that a hundred American cities were on fire. So we've been here before. Oz Guinness, well known writer and thinker, Philosopher suggests that what's happening in our country today is almost a, a replay of the French Revolution. Maybe not that bad yet, but, but heading that way. Do you remember the French Revolution? You know, the historians tell us since the 17th century there have been five major revolutions in the world. English Revolution, 1642. American, 1776. Uh, French, 1789, lasted about 10 years. Russian, 1917. Chinese, 1949. The first two had biblical roots. The last three did not. The American Revolution had biblical roots in the sense that there was this, this pervasive thinking that man is a sinner, and therefore, power is a dangerous thing in the hands of sinners. And so there must be checks and balances, and there must be a separation of powers. But there was also this thinking that he is, he is a, a created being made by a creator, and he bears the image of that creator, and therefore he's been endowed by that creator with certain inalienable rights, like the right to life and liberty and the pursuit of happiness. So there were those biblical uh, roots. The French Revolution, by sharp contrast, was anti-Christian, anti-biblical, and anti-clerical. It was utopian in nature. It believed that man was perfectible, that the only thing that needed to happen for man to achieve utopia is for man to be set free from his oppressors. And who were those oppressors? Well, one of the big ones was the church. And there were a lot of things wrong with the church, to be sure. The church owned a lot of land and had a lot of money and was able to impose a sort of a, a tithe tax, I guess you'd call it. And the people were suffering, and there was poverty and hunger, years of bad harvest. And so the recipe was there for a revolution to take place. And because the church was viewed as one of the oppressors, it wasn't long before you began to see statues come down and crosses and bells from church buildings. And the Sabbath was abolished, and saint days were abolished. And churches became temples of reason. In fact, in 1793, there was a so-called festival of reason held at the Notre Dame Cathedral. And one year later, 1794, the estimates are that very few of France's roughly 40,000 churches were even open any longer. And ever since then, you see, France, and we might as well add Russia and China, have been openly hostile to the Christian faith. Now, nobody's talking about a new American revolution. At least I don't hear that. But to be sure, there is a, a revolt of sorts underway, a pushback against these long-cherished biblical roots. And again, there's this thought that we, we must rid ourselves of oppressors. You'll, you'll hear terms like critical theory or critical race theory or cultural Marxism or socialism. And the idea is we, we just have to be liberated from our oppressors 
and then we'll make it. And in many ways, this, this whatever you want to call it, pushback, revolution, revolt, rebellion, <laughs> started back in the 1960s. It just didn't have the widespread support back in those days that it enjoys today. Any of you remember reading William Butler Yeats' poem called The Second Coming? Even without Joyce Wood as my teacher, I had to read that poem, The Second Coming. And in that poem, Yeats mentions the rough beast slouching toward Bethlehem to be born. You have to ask Joyce Wood what that beast is. I don't know. I didn't know then. I still don't know now what beast he's talking about. But I want to borrow that image and suggest to you there's a very rough beast slouching, maybe racing toward America. And it's a very formidable, menacing beast almost crouching at the door. Some unhealthy, ungodly combination of, of uh, Hollywood entertainers, secular universities and colleges and higher learning, Radical media, a judicial uh, area that still needs some help, even at the highest levels. And who is the oppressor today? I have bad news for you. It's you and me. People that believe in God, people that believe in Jesus, people that believe in the Holy Spirit, people that believe in the Bible, people that believe in law and order, people that believe in respecting the flag, people that appreciate our history and can acknowledge, yes, there's some, there are problems in our history, but we don't have to rewrite history. Let's just learn from history. People that believe in immigration that's safe and legal. People that believe in marriage between one man and one woman that ought to last a lifetime. People that believe in, in uh, one set of bathrooms for men, one set of bathrooms for women. It's a shame we have to even talk about these things. People that believe in sanctuaries in churches, not cities. People that believe in the sanctity of every human life. Young, old, rich, poor, it matters not. Health, wealth, it matters not. People that believe in biblical correctness far more so than political correctness. Unfortunately, we are the problem. We are the oppressors. And so this rough beast, you see, would seek to dismantle, rewrite history, and reshape the country that we love. You know the name Michael Flynn, of course, General Flynn. He's been in the news a lot lately. He recently wrote these words. I was once told, if we're not careful, 2% of the passionate will control 98% of the indifferent 100% of the time. There is now a small group of passionate people working hard to destroy our American way of life. If the U.S. wants to survive the onslaught of socialism and continue to enjoy self-government and the liberty of our hard-fought freedoms, we have to understand that there are two opposing forces. One is the children of light. The other is the children of darkness. I believe the attacks presented to us today are part of a well-orchestrated and well-funded effort that uses oppression as its sword to leverage and legitimize violence and crime, not to seek or serve the truth. The dark forces' weapons formed against us serve one purpose, to promote radical social change through power and control. They are also intent on driving God out of our families, our schools, and our courts. They are even seeking the very removal of God from our churches, essentially hoping to remove God from our everyday lives. Here's the point. We serve one God and two countries. 
We serve this country and we serve that other country that's a better country. And the more faithful we are to that country, the more good we will do for this country. I'm all for making America great again. I hope you are too. Uh, we should all be for uh, uh, keeping America great as long as we understand what it was that made America great in the first place. And I don't believe it was the economy, and I don't believe it was the military in spite of great heroism. I prefer what de Tocqueville said. It was the churches that made her great, and not some beautiful building, but the pulpits of those churches that he described as a flame with righteousness, by which he meant the preachers were unashamedly reminding people that we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and weakly were issuing the divine summons to repent of our sin and have faith in Jesus Christ whose blood can make the foulest clean and who went farther, as Dale said earlier, and exhorted God's people to a life of righteousness and holiness that is characterized by love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and goodness and kindness and meekness and self-control. That's what will make America great. We serve one God unashamedly and two countries. Otherwise, if we neglect this gospel of righteousness, isn't it interesting? The answer is always the gospel. Have you noticed that? It's always the gospel. But if we neglect it, the rough beast will have no mercy. It will be exceedingly rough on us. So think about Solzhenitsyn's question that he asked Americans in, 19, in the 1970s. Are you prepared to gamble your civilization? Father, <clears throat> we would not deny you. We would certainly not defy you. We would love our country by loving you and being faithful to you and serving as the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Forgive us for our cowardice. Forgive us for our indifference, our reticence. We thank you for this good land and know it's a, it's a, it's a gift from you. And so make us good stewards of this gift that we would use our freedoms wisely and cherish them. And may our pulpits once again be aflame with righteousness. For Jesus' sake and in his name we pray, amen.